Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is William van der Akker. I'm working at the University of Utrecht. Um, and I want to talk about creativity, about inspiration, and about a lot of misunderstandings. Um, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, as a child, um, you have, when you are creative, you have a mental blueprint. You know what to draw. Um, but in the end, you make a product that doesn't look like your mental blueprint. That's when you're one and two and three. But it changes after three or four. That's when children become aware that there's a difference between their mental blueprint and their product. And the difference, they hate the difference. I'll come back to that at the end. Now, there's a one misunderstanding that I just want to start getting out of the way. That's that creativity is something for artists, Nobel Prize winners, Einstein's. Every deed, making something, is an act of creativity. So lesson, my lesson number one is you are all creative. That's a nice thing to go home, I think. But I immediately want to disappoint you. Not all of your products of creativity are interesting. <laughs> and that's my lesson number two. Now let's take an example. Let's take the most simple IKEA nightstand. What you, what you do once you have passed the IKEA nightmare and have it at home, you have the mental blueprint. You have the perfect picture of the nightstand. You know exactly how it looks because it's printed in the catalog. And you start to screw it. And it all goes well, but then the last screw is not fitting well. And you unscrew it and you do it again. And it's not fitting well again. So you push a little harder. And then you hear the wood say, Crack. And you know. I can do two things. One, squeak, screw further, screw the whole thing, go back to the IKEA nightmare, buy a new one, start all over again, or stop. Because the screw is at the back of the nightstand. And you will put it into, against the wall and think nobody will see it. And that's where you're right and that's where you're wrong. You're right because your partner will say, wow, thank you. This is the perfect nightstand. I didn't know you were that technical. You're wrong because you know it's not perfect. There will forever be that damn screw at the end of the thing. So, there is always, and that's my lesson three, a discrepancy between A and B, between what you want to create and what you actually create between your mental blueprint and your product. And that difference may be big, that may be small, may be interesting, may be uninteresting, but that's the difference. And there's always a fundamental difference between the maker of the thing and the spectator or the listener. Now let's, let's turn to music. Uh, suppose a quintet playing Schubert's quintet in C. There is a mental blueprint for you as the audience and for the players how the, how the piece goes. They have a score, they know where to begin, and they know where to end. And you have a kind of expectation. This is the Amati Quintet, together with uh, Andrea Schiff or, or Jordi Saval on cello. And you have an expectation of how their interpretation will sound. OK. The players, however, Play it every time they, they hear differences. And the differences can be bad or good. For instance, the cello is tired and the violins have to drag the cello down through the piece. You won't hear it because they're professionals. But they will hear it. Or the other way around, the cello all, all of a sudden plays an A in a different way. And the violins, they go along 
on the golden wings of something new. You won't hear that. They will. That's the difference. That's when a difference appears, and that's what they will call suddenness, coincidence, serendipity, inspiration, formerly a kiss from the muse. It will appear all of a sudden, out of nowhere. But skilled performers know that it, inspiration only comes with transpiration. Like the French poet Paul Valéry once wrote, and that's for poetry, he said, if I take a sonnet, 14 lines of a sonnet, the, f the first one of the lines I got for free from the gods, all of a sudden, but I have to make 13 lines myself that sound as divine as that one. And the reader is not supposed to see where the divine line was that I got for free and where the other ones that I made. And that's hard work. Now that's why T.S. Eliot, his English counterpart said, there is no such thing as free verse. There's only bad verse and good verse. Now in music, I think this is lesson number one, there's no freedom in improvisation or there's no complete freedom. There are always boundaries. There may be strict, there may be loose, like in jazz. Uh, even in the most free jazz, like the bleep bleep jazz, there are boundaries. And there are always restrictions. So that's the misunderstanding number two, improvisation is freedom. Let's take an example from flamenco, one of my favorite music forms. And there's a lot of improvisation in there, but it's very strict. There's a strict framework. Let's take the basic form of soliaris, 12 beats. And the accents are on 3, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And it sounds like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 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 nine. Hear it? That's totally different from Western music. That's, that's where the, the Arabic influence is. Anyway, the 12 beats can be imagined as a wagon of a train. And a soliaris is a train of wagons of 12 beats, not 11 beats, not 13 beats, but 12, always 12. So where's the improvisation? The improvisation is in the combination of wagons. Let's, let's take a singer or a guitar player. He or she can change the order of the wagons. He can put one wagon in front of the other because last night he did the other way around and it didn't sound good, but now it sounds good all of a sudden. He can change the color. She can change the color. So change the chord scheme all of a sudden going from D to A and then back to D again. But the wagons are still at the same length always 12 beats. They then produce a train. And that when the train is rolling, and it's almost rolling out of itself, now all of a sudden, there's this mysterious phenomenon that the Spanish flamenco players and singers and dancers call duende. What is duende? There's this, all of a sudden, this, this difference between what you think you can make, are making, and what you're really actually making. That's the inspiration. That's the kiss of the muse. It suddenly happens, or not, but you cannot force it. And again, it's not restricted to music. One of my examples is from f uh, physics. The physician um, um, Kekule, found, he, he was at home and he was looking in, in, in his fire and he saw the flames and in the flames he saw a snake biting itself in the tail. And he thought, this is how the molecular structure of benzol is. And it was true. 
Now, this is what we call serendipity. But I am a literary scholar. If I look at, my, at home, in my fire, and I see flames, and in the flames I see a snake biting itself in its tail, I won't think, hey, I just found out the molecular structure of benzol. So serendipity can only come up in the right heads, so someone who is looking at the right problem. Now, Valéry puts it another way. He said, every day, 10,000s of the most brilliant ideas are produced in the wrong minds. <laughs> now, in the end is my beginning. I'll return to the childhood. Remember, the first stage, the child is not aware that there's a discrepancy between his or her mental blueprint and what the child actually draws. And then, after that, after three or four, or sometimes five, the child realizes that his drawing is not looking like his or her mental blueprint. And it becomes aware of the lack of technical skill. I read that in, in, in a psychology book some years ago, and, and, and the two of my oldest of five children, I had only two then, were three and seven. And we were camping, and it was raining for days and days and days. And there was a mean dog on the camping ground, and everybody was scared, and I pretended not to be scared of the dog, but I was. But I tried to keep the kids busy, and I said, why don't you go draw the dog? Because I thought, very naively, that will make them less afraid of the dog, which was not true, by the way. So they started drawing the dog. And the young one, three years old, said, I'm also going to draw the dog. I said, that's fine. So I gave them pencils. And then after 10 minutes, the oldest one, from seven, he wiped all the pencils he was very angry, off the table, and said, I cannot draw a dog. And I thought, hey, face too. That's the kind of father I am. But the young one just continued. And then after 10 minutes, she came to me very proudly, showing my, her picture, and said, a strawberry. And you could obviously see what she had done. She started with the biggest thing of the dog, the doggiest thing, which is the belly. You won't start with the ears. But small, little children cannot draw a circle. So she, I mean, at the end, she tried to connect the two. And she looked at it and said, well, this is more like a strawberry than a dog. So I draw a strawberry. <laughs> now, um, let me repeat lesson one. You're all creative every day. But let me also repeat lesson two. Whether it's interesting what you make, I can tell. But there's a last lesson I would like to give to you. If you want to draw a dog and always try to stick closely and maybe convulsively to your mental blueprint, the chances are that the result will not be interesting. What I would try is to start with the dog and end with the strawberry. Thank you. <laughs>